Good evening. My name is Erin Lowe, and I am a student project manager at the Clark Forum for Contemporary Issues at Dickinson College. On behalf of the Clark Forum, I am pleased to welcome you to tonight's event, Food in a Time of Crisis. Have you ever been hungry? I mean, truly hungry. Sure, we've all experienced a desire for food, but have you ever not known where your next meal was coming from? One in nine adults in the United States is food insecure, which means they don't know where their next meal is coming from. For many families, food access was already extremely limited prior to the onset of COVID-19. The virus and the subsequent quarantine measures severely threatened supply chains and food access. Many families rely upon assistance programs, as do students. The summertime is one of the most crucial times for food networks because children are no longer receiving meals at school, nor are families receiving food from backpack programs. This global pandemic is unprecedented in the scope of its impact. Thus, it is important now, more important now than ever, to consider those who are food insecure. I've been volunteering for Harvester's Food Network since I was six years old. Since then, I have spent more than 1,500 hours sorting food, running food drives, developing strategies for youth engagement, and leading volunteer efforts in the Kansas City area. The most important thing I've learned during my time there is who is truly impacted by hunger. It's easy to dismiss the issue and say that it is only a problem that occurs in countries on the other side of the world, but such a myopic view neglects to consider the reality of the situation. People are food insecure everywhere we look. If it's not you, it's your neighbors. If it's not your family, then it's your friends. The most striking piece of information I have received is the fact that there exists enough food on this planet to feed everyone, but disproportionate distribution and extreme food waste create the massive inequality experienced by communities all around the world. Today, our panelists will explore the implications of this global pandemic related to food, supply chains, and access. Jean Halpin co-founded the Dickinson College Organic Farm in 2007. She was the founding president of Farmers on the Square, and she has served on the Pennsylvania Association for Sustainable Agriculture Board for nine years. In addition, Halpin estab helped establish Dickinson's Food Study Certificate Program and developed the college's regional purchasing initiatives. Andrea Carnes is Vice President of Marketing and Sales at Carnes Quality Food, which has nine locations in central Pennsylvania. She is on the board of the Pennsylvania Food Merchants Association, as well as the Center of Dairy Excellence. Carnes is also a member of the Elizabethtown College Leadership Council. Robert D. Weed is a Dickinson alumnus and serves as the CEO of Project Share in Carlisle. He acts as an advocate for those struggling with food insecurity and is a director of the Cumberland County Food Alliance, as well as the Carlisle Youth Initiative. Part of his advocacy work requires educating and engaging legislators and community leaders. There will be a question and answer session immediately following the program. So please type your questions in the live chat next to this YouTube video at any time. Lynn Wen, Clark Forum Student Co-Supervisor, will be moderating the question. Thank you so much for attending. We will now begin the presentation addressing or adjusting our, our farm operation accordingly. So the college farm is actually 180 acres of um, production and pasture um, acreage. It's a certified organic operation. So we each year raise between eight and 10 acres of certified organic vegetables. And we have about 60 acres of pasture on which we raise grass-fed beef and grass-fed lamb. Uh, we are what's called an educational production farm. So we employ students throughout the academic school year. Between 14 and 16 students work with us in all aspects of the farm operation, from planting and harvesting to managing our livestock, building projects, et cetera. So they're really involved with all aspects of our farm operation. Um, we also work with the academic departments on campus. So we work very closely with all divisions, the arts and humanities, social sciences, and, and hard sciences and we serve in a capacity of support to them. Um, and that also includes the Food Studies Certificate Program. Um, we have a seasonal apprenticeship program as well. So these are leadership programs for young aspiring leaders, but within the context of a farming operation. Um, and then during the summer months, we employ students that work with us full time. Uh, the college farm is kind of a hybrid model. Uh, we are actually considered a revenue generating entity of the college. So 
All of our production and programming expenses are paid for through vegetable sales and meat sales. Um, and then the college supports most of our, uh, our staffing. Um, so it's a, it's a hybrid model that um, kind of gives intention to what we're trying to do because um, we can only expand and grow a program as our revenue allows. So with that said, our main revenue outlets are the dining hall at Dickinson. We um, supply a portion of the seasonal produce to the dining hall when we meet with the chef every year to outline what those crops will be for an annual basis. We also have a campus supported agriculture program similar to a community supported agriculture program, but we limit our membership to the Dickinson um, community and we have about 130 families that we support through that um, 24 or 30 week program that we offer. And we also sell at the local farmers markets, um, farmers on the square. We're actually, if you've been to the market, we are the wood fired pizza operation and fresh vegetable vendor. Um, and then in addition to our sales, we do work very closely with Project Share. Um, through a donation um, capacity. Uh, last year, we donated close to 6,000 pounds of fresh organic produce to Project Share and also around 1,500 pounds to the local gleaning project. So um, working with uh, programs that address food insecurity and food access is also part of our mission. Um, in terms of how we're adapting to um, the coronavirus, um, as you probably know, the campus is closed and our students are no longer engaging in um, campus-based um, education. And so that has affected the campus across from every nook and cranny of the campus, including the college farm. So the students that we have employed to help us with all aspects of the program in terms of production have all gone home. Um, and so right now we have about five uh, full-time staff members that are farm-based and we um, typically have about uh, 18 people who are working with us in some capacity. So we've shrunk from about 18 to, to five. Um, and so what we're doing is we're adjusting our priorities and our roles um, to cover the farm production needs until around mid-May. Um, we just reserved, uh, received approval from the college to pursue our summer staffing mm -hmm. needs. So we okay. have um, six Turn the volume students who will be wow. returning to um, Carlisle in May to work with us full time and um, four apprentices who will be working with us as our, part of our six month apprenticeship program. Um, so what we're doing on the farm is we are just like we are out in the community social distancing, even with five people, we are um, really trying to avoid close proximity contact. And if we ever have to work together, we are wearing face masks. Um, we're staggering our lunch uh, eating area so that we're not really sharing space and sanitizing regularly. Um, so really following the CDC and the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture protocols for farm workers to ensure that we are keeping ourselves healthy. In terms of um, serving our community for with, with their food needs, we have developed a curbside um, program whereby our CSA members can place orders for uh, vegetables and meat that we raise on our farm and um, coordinate with us a vegetable pickup that um, happens Monday through Friday. So we have orders that are yeah. received and processed and then picked up um, literally curbside. And that is um, what it seems like is the trend um, for farm based um, operations moving forward. And that's kind of my, my side of things. I'll turn it over to Andrea or Bob? We're hoping to hear from Bob now. Outstanding. Thank you, Jen. Uh, Bob Weed, CEO of Project Share. Uh, thank you for having us here. This is a, a, going to be an interesting discussion, I'm sure. What I'd like to do is take a little bit of time and talk about you know, what Project Share normally does, uh, how the COVID-19 COVID has impacted our world uh, and share with you some of the observations we're seeing from out on the street. And then uh, finish with, I think, some of the challenges that Project Share, along with many other organizations in the community are facing. So as many of you might be aware, Project Share is a, a faith-based food pantry. We serve the greater Carlisle area. And our, our goal is, our job is, primary focus, is working with families and individuals who are struggling with hunger and food insecurity. 
our vision at Project Share is nourishing our community and awakening hope. And I'm quick to remind folks that for us, nourishing our community means a lot more than just putting food in the basket. It's about spiritual nourishment and social nourishment and economic nourishment as well. And I can't, you know, in today's, today's environment, I can't under, underscore that piece that says awakening hope as well, because let's face it, no matter who you are, when you turn the television on, listen to the radio or look at the paper, it's not filled with a lot of hope right now. Uh, we're best known for our food distribution models. We have two primary. One is uh, we hold during the third week of the month here at North Orange Street. And uh, through that distribution, our goal is to provide each client family with enough food for their family for a week. During the other three weeks of the month, we have distribution at our farm stand location at Pitt and Lincoln Street. And that's a supplemental program for, fam for our families. We focus on vegetables, fruit, whole grain bread, and dairy product. Uh, and that operation runs, again, the other three weeks of the month, uh, distributions held on Tuesdays and Thursdays. But in addition to, to that type of activity, Project Share is engaged in a lot of other things that uh, I just want to share with you all. First, we help support our school-aged children through our backpack program. We work with both Carlisle School District and South Middleton School District. We folk, traditionally, we focus on uh, middle school and elementary school aged children, and we provide uh, healthy, nutritious food in our, through our backpack program for those kids to have over the weekend. We engage in educational activities. We run an adult nutrition class that we call Slice of the Month. We have a children's nutrition class we call Kids in the Kitchen, and we run a program called Food for Life during distribution. And that's a way for us to allow clients to better understand how they can utilize some of the resources that we're providing them. We promote social uh, enrichment activities. We have a group who uses our farm stand every Sunday and holds a yoga class there. We've been running uh, a, an after school program every other Monday. It happens to be a chess club that we're running out of farm stand. And a couple other enrichment programs like that. During the summer, we run what we call Lunch and Learn, which is a summer feeding program. We operate in five different uh, locations around Carlisle. Uh, we serve about 250 children across the span of summer vacation. And we not only provide access to uh, breakfast and lunch item for them, but we also roll in activities built around math, science, and reading. Uh, during the summer and fall months, we run a gleaning program where through relationships we have with farmers in the community, we send teams of volunteers out to do a second harvest, if you would. Last year, our cleaning teams harvested 140,000 pounds of produce that we were able to bring back and get out into the community, produce that otherwise would have been plowed under. We utilize the cleaning program and, and other volunteer activities to offer team building and service-based learning exercises. And we've hosted groups from spanning the, the spectrum. We've hosted uh, folks from the South Middleton football team. We've had Dickinson College sports teams. And we work with Yellow Breaches Educational Center and host some of their students in those events. Most recently, you know, we work closely with our other partners in the community and most recently, we've been working with Sadler Health Center on uh, kind of a, a food RX program where patients that they're working with, for example, someone who may be struggling with diabetes, could be referred to Project Share. And we could help provide nutrition counseling and access to, frankly, diabetic-friendly food. So as I said, it's, it's much more than just putting food in the basket. Now, okay. coronavirus and COVID-19, like almost every other organization in our community, business, 
civic, faith-based, educational, has turned our world upside down. It's just that plain and simple. Uh, everything we do nowadays, one of the paramount components that go into structuring activities is the health and safety of everyone involved, our volunteers, our clients, our staff. Uh, when you think about, you know, Project SHARE is able to do what we do because of a, an army of volunteers who give generously of their time. And traditionally, our volunteer base has been made up of, shall I say, seasoned citizens. Uh, most of our core volunteers are retired individuals, many of whom have some sort of an underlying condition. In today's environment, those are folks that, while we love them dearly, we need to ask them to stay home and stay safe because they're a group, as we've all heard, that's more at risk. Uh, we've been able to recruit additional volunteers the, through a whole host of efforts. But again, Jen alluded to it at the farm, we need to now, for the safety of our volunteers, control the size of the volunteer population who's on site so we can maintain social distancing. Uh, we need to be very vigilant about uh, health, safety, sanitary conditions, uh, and down, on, on down the list. Uh, from a client perspective, uh, we've rocked their world. Our traditional distribution models have been what's referred to as a, as a modified client choice model. So clients came into our facility and had a shopping experience and could choose the product that they the best fit their family's needs. We've had to change that whole model so that we're providing drive-through or curbside uh, distribution. It means a couple of things for our clients. That means we're eliminating choice, uh, which is an important component, I feel, of of how we do business, uh, but it's also eliminating some of that social interaction that they might have. And in terms of my staff, I, I've got to tip my hat to my team because they've had to learn how to work differently. How to work differently, I have about 30% of our team is working remotely right now. Uh, since we are a full-blown warehouse distribution operation, unfortunately, not everyone can do that. So those who are still here have to, you know, have to learn how to, to work differently. Our building, for example, is on lockdown. So people aren't wandering in and out. Uh, we have to adjust to different routines, different schedules, and frankly, different needs of the volunteers who are coming in to help us. So what are we seeing on the street? Uh, kind of walk through a timeline that'll hopefully give you an idea of how this is all unfolding. Uh, COVID-19 coronavirus started to, we started to hear a lot of noise about mitigation, started to, that, that topic started to be, the volume got turned up in the beginning of March. So our first main distribution uh, here at the warehouse was the week of March 16th. And I will tell you quite honestly, we, the week before, we had been working hard to put together a plan that followed all the guidelines put out by the CDC, the Department of Health, all the things that we could do to mitigate risk. If you think back, it was that weekend or over that weekend that all of those recommendations started to change. So it became very apparent by the time we got to Sunday night that the plans that we had made on Friday were out the window. We had to come in and revamp everything and come up with a way to do a curbside, no contact, drive-through type distribution. And again, my team can work miracles because in 24 hours, it happened. It didn't happen, you know, I don't think by mistake. We had uh, some great volunteers who happened to be school teachers who had just been cut loose from school who were looking for something to do, who came in, helped us pack boxes. My team thought through and worked out the logistics. We had uh, Dickinson's safety uh, folks here to walk through and help us think through how we move 
clients through the parking lot and through a drive-through distribution. So it was a real undertaking. Fortunately, we were able to take that model and run it during the, the four days of distribution in March and run it successfully and got good feedback from clients, from volunteers, and, and from my team. The following week was supposed to be a distribution, start distribution at our farm stand location. And we did. Our goal all along has to be has to not miss a beat for our clients. Uh, we were able to replicate the drive-through model at farm stand at Pitt and Lincoln Street. We put a big tent up in the parking lot where we could stage product. And we're fortunate that Birch Street, or there's an alley that runs down between farm stand and Everling Palmer Park, so we could run a drive-through model down, down that alley. And we did the first week, uh, so that would be the week of the 23rd, we saw a slight in, increase in the number of clients who were utilizing farm stand. I should go back and mention during our dis main distribution in, in March, we served about, or about 760 families, which is pretty much on par for a March distribution. So not much of a change there. The following week at Farm Stand, we saw about 25 or 30 more families than we normally would. We normally serve about 200 families a week through Farm Stand. And that number popped up to about 220, 225 or so. So knowing that that model worked, we, we regrouped and planned for the next week's distribution at Farm Stand. That would be uh, the week of the 30th. And we guesstimated that we'd see an increase and we were right. We went from serving about 200 families a week through Farm Stand to that following week serving 312. So that is a pretty significant increase. This week, this is the third week out from distribution. Uh, today was a distribution day and we served uh, 180 families in one day. We're expecting to see that kind of volume again on Thursday when we do distribution there. Uh, in terms of uh, new clients or increased need in the community, again, to kind of walk through a timeline, the first week, uh, which would be the week of the 23rd, we added about 28 new families to the Project Share family. And the interesting part of that, I think, is as I look back on it, is the majority of those individuals were folks whose income was not affected by coronavirus. It wasn't affected by any layoffs or anything like that. There were folks who uh, receive disability or social security income. Uh, but I think it's a similar reaction to what, and Andrea, I'm sure we'll talk about this uh, when she's on, but it's similar to what we've seen in, in, in our retail grocery stores. It's people looking for the security of knowing they have resources available that made, made us see that jump in, in that population of our client base. Last week, the, the second week, we added another 21 families to our roles. And those individuals were definitely uh, impacted by coronavirus. Uh, those, the majority of those folks had been laid off, had experienced uh, some of the challenges of getting signed up for unemployment insurance and realized that the unemployment insurance doesn't come or check doesn't come right away. So we, we saw a significant change in the population that was uh, approaching Project Share for help. This week we've seen, we've onboarded uh, six new families and all of those have been impacted from an income standpoint uh, by business shutdowns and, and stay at home orders. Uh, and the, the, other, the other interesting piece that uh, we're seeing is frankly a, a tighter partnership with uh, member other organizations in our community, specifically Salvation Army and New Life Community Church, both of which both organizations provide meals to families in need. 
So we're becoming kind of uh, and willingly offered to be a grocery store for both those organizations. Neither of them have a lot of uh, storage space. We have warehouse floor space. We have coolers and freezers that we can share and store product in for them. Uh, and we have uh, now on a regular basis, we have both those organizations coming by to pick up product. The other organization we're working really tightly with right now is Community Cares, who deals with the homeless uh, individuals in our community. And you know, so for example, when they have a chance to shelter a family in a hotel, they get in touch with us and we're able to provide, uh, if you would, we kind of load the pantry up for those folks interesting we need to be attuned to what kind of resources they have even if they're being sheltered in a hotel so that we're providing appropriate resources for them so if a family only has a microwave and a small uh, hotel refrigerator to work with we need to be providing resources that they can utilize in that kind of an environment uh, and then the school districts uh, both uh, Carlisle School District and South Middleton School District are really uh, doing a, a land office business on providing breakfast and lunch for those families who are uh, those children who participate in the free and reduced lunch program. And we're continuing the production of our backpacks, our weekend food supply for those, those kiddos. Uh, we've gone from uh, a run rate that was where we were serving it's kind of settling in around 340 kids uh, a week that we were serving through that backpack program. Now we're serving about 450 kids. And I've just got an email today, that number will be increasing for next week. So what are some of the, the challenges we're facing? Like everyone else, doing business a different way. Uh, you know, prepack, running a drive through model, curbside model, requires that we prepackage food product. Well, that seems silly, but that means things like we need boxes, bags, we need gloves, hats, or, or hair nets, masks, uh, sanitary wipes, uh, things that we wouldn't normally be in the market for, we're out looking for now. Uh, we also need volunteers to come in and package that product. And we've been blessed that we've been able to recruit and, and seem to have a rhythm going now with volunteers, getting accustomed to how we're operating and, the, and feeling good about some of the safety precautions we have in place. Uh, we need product to fill those boxes. And quite honestly, the, the supply of shelf stable, you know, canned goods, uh, dry goods for us seems to be pretty good. Where we're getting a little bit of a, a pinch is when it comes to produce. You go back, you know, you think about, we wanna provide access to healthy, nutritious food for our families. We've done that by really ramping up the amount of vegetables and fruit in particular that we're able to share with families. One of our biggest sources of that uh, are through our grocery retail partners who at the end of the day, the end of the week, share with us through in-kind contributions their surplus. Now, I'm sure most of you have been to the grocery store recently. When you think about what you see in the produce section and how that has been getting cleared out on a regular basis or the meat section, uh, there's just not a lot of surplus right now for our retail partners to be sharing with us. Uh, the other source that we use fairly regularly is the Central Pennsylvania Food Bank, and they have a relationship with MARC, which is a produce cooperative out of Philadelphia. And the food bank is able to take advantage of surplus product from that co-op, but they're seeing the same thing happen where there's a bigger demand and a smaller amount of surplus produce that's, that's become available. I'm seeing early signs that that's turning around and that, that those kind of surpluses will be coming more available. So there seems to be a little bit of light at the end of the, the tunnel. Uh, 
like most organizations, funding is, is something that we're really keeping an eye on. When, when we're not, when we don't receive those uh, kind of in-kind donations, particularly in food, we go out and purchase it. You know, plus we're incurring other expenses that we wouldn't normally be incurring. Uh, there are uh, kind of on the good side, there are some parts of the stimulus package that was passed that will help organizations like Project Share and, and other nonprofits as well as small businesses in the community and applications and the process is underway for those programs. And there are a number of, a uh, couple of organizations who have started to uh, collect and distribute funds throughout the community. United Way in particular, as well as Partnership for Better Health, both have emergency relief funding that's, uh, that they're working on making available. Not to paint a doom and gloom picture, I will share one thing with you that's a little bit fun. You think about part of what we do is educational component. Uh, and one of my favorite activities was participating in our kids in the kitchen class. Well, it was kind of a favorite activity for a lot of our client families as well. And we've been able to take that. I'm, I am blessed because I have a very creative and resourceful team. Uh, Weston Petrosky, who's our nutrition coordinator, huddled up with Joe Clozo, who's our communication guy, and they came up with a way for us to live stream our kids in the kitchen class. We've done it three times now, Weston cooking from his kitchen at home, and we live stream it, we record it, and we post it on our website, on YouTube, and on Facebook. And the exciting part for me is, you know, we get 15, 12, 15 participants in the live stream, but we're seeing 100 or more individuals click through it and view it on Facebook. So, you know, there's some things that we've been forced to do that we might continue doing going forward. Things like that. If I can get nutrition education out to a bigger population through something like that, that's a win. Anyways, I've taken up my time. I'll turn it over to Andrea. All right, Bob. Well, that was nice that you ended on a on a positive note there. So we take any any light you can, right? Um, so as a as I was introduced, my name is Andrea Carnes. I work with my my family's business, Carnes Foods. I'm a third generation family member. Um, just a brief background: we started in 1959, and um, so we're 61 years, and we're a traditional grocery store with nine stores in the Harrisburg area. Um, you know, as I'm just going to echo what my what my fellow panelists had said, which is this past month, you know, everyone's lives have been turned upside down. Um, every, every single person's been touched by this and it's no different for, for us within the retail industry. You know, our, our day to day das tasks, our goals, our procedures, um, everything's been been uprooted. Uh, I went from planning Easter promotions to suddenly taking a look and saying, what are, what is social distancing and how do we incorporate that in, a school, in, our, in our stores? And social distancing was a term that four weeks ago, most people didn't know, it didn't resonate, it didn't land. And suddenly it's part of our lifestyle. Um, and we have to work to keep our team members safe and we have to work to keep our customers safe all while providing the food and necessities that people are looking for. Um, so to say it's been crazy and stressful and <laughs> ridiculously uncertain uh, is, is an understatement. Um, and I know that everyone feels that when they go in the grocery store, they have questions as to what are these stores doing to protect us and what are these stores doing to fill the shelves. And hopefully I can share a little bit of insight into Carnes is doing and what's taking place and and why. Um, so, so just to get started, I'm gonna jump into talking about the grocery shelves. Um, as it was alluded, when you go into any grocery store right now, you walk the store um, from the this center. Of the Andrea Carnes. 
to the to the aisles, you know, you see gaps, you see some empty shelf space. And one of the big questions that people ask is, are we going to have a food shortage? You know, what, what's going on? And the quick, simple answer is no. Um, we're not going to have a food shortage. We experience a lot of panic buying. Um, you know, folks coming in with their carts, throwing mass amounts of canned goods and toilet paper and paper towels and cleaning supplies into those carts and leaving because that was one element of security that they could provide for themselves. Um, but the, again, we, we don't see a, a food shortage taking place. What we do see, what we are going to see taking place, um, which for a lot of individuals is, is new, is that we're going to have limited assortments. You know, as consumers, we've been really fortunate, most of us, um, we've been really fortunate that we have favorite flavors and we have favorite brands and we have favorite pack sizes that our, our groceries come in, you know? Whether you like the big jar of peanut butter or a smaller one, like you're, you're able to go and get exactly that honey roasted, extra crunchy Jif peanut butter. Um, and we're gonna see that change. You know, we're already seeing that and that, that's gonna be the foreseeable future. Um, what we're seeing, uh, what, uh, what I'm talking with my vendors about is that these consumer packaged good companies, these CPG companies, they are operating at around 90% capacity. They are burning and churning and getting product out. Um, but their focus is on the core products. Um, so we're seeing some of those fringe items, some of those specialty flavors kind of drifting away. You know, I, I had a customer contact me saying, hey, where's the, where's the Flaming Hot Doritos? Uh, why don't you have them in the store? And the answer is because right now Frito-Lay has shifted all their production into their traditional core items. That's what they, that's their emphasis. That's what they're working to make sure that they have the inventory on. Um, so you might have to do with uh, traditional Doritos, no, no flaming hot. Um, just as English muffins, you know, seasonal flavors are taking a back burner while the core flavors, the original the cinnamon raisin, that's what they're working to make sure they produce and they have available to the customers. Um, but a lot of times folks are still saying why. Why is it that these shelves have gaps, you know? Um, they're not, we're not necessarily eating anymore. I mean, maybe we're baking more at home, <laughs> you know, a little bit of comfort food, um, but we're not necessarily eating anymore. So why are we seeing these shortages? Um, and a big reason of that is the how, which is the how we as consumers are, were previously eating food and how we are now. Um, you know, prior to COVID-19, uh, approximately 50% of an individual's meals we're outside of the house. Um, so your breakfast, your lunch, your dinner, your snacks, 50% of the time that you had a food or drink, you were consuming that outside of your four walls. So whether it was a drive through or a cafe or a brewery, you were going somewhere else and getting those food items. Um, and that all changed. You know, maybe you're still getting takeout. Um, maybe you're still running through a drive through on occasion, but for the most part, that stopped and that food that they were getting, that you were getting at these restaurants and these cafes, you know, that was coming from a food service wholesaler. Um, and that food service wholesaler was packaging it differently than how we as consumers would package it. You know, they were producing for commercial kitchens versus the home kitchen. And so they were, had these big bags, these 50 pound bags of flour versus the five pound bag of flour that you would buy or uh, the 10 pound, 25 pound cans of tomatoes versus a 12 ounce can. Um, for most individuals picking up these products, bringing them home, you know, picking up a 50 pound bag of russet baking potatoes to bring that home into your kitchen, for most people, <laughs> that's a pretty, pretty unrealistic buy. Um, it's a lot of potatoes. Uh, you know, but that's where a bulk of our food inventory, a bulk of the food availability was being found. It was being found in those commercial, uh, in the, the food service industry. Um, so what we're happening now, one, one thing that Carnes is doing that a lot of other retailers are doing, is we're now partnering with those food service providers. Um, we're working with them to fill in some of those gaps. Um, we're from you know, different mayonnaise options, different canned items to repackaging 
some of those big bulk bags of potatoes into smaller, more consumer friendly bags of potatoes to help fill in those gaps. So, you know, we're redirecting those food service buys into the traditional supermarket aisles and perimeters. Um, additionally, right now, we are having to get creative, uh, reaching out to different suppliers, maybe working with a different supplier or an old supplier in a different way. Um, for example, Terranetti's is a great bakery located in Mechanicsburg. They do uh, really phenomenal rolls and it's something that we've carried in our stores for, for years. Um, and they do a lot of commercial production as well for commercial restaurants. Um, one item that we didn't utilize prior um, was they, they did for restaurants uh, a really great Italian loaf of bread. Um, and when this all really took off, when the panic buying really set in, when that urgency to fill your pantry, fill your home with nutrients happened, uh, a lot of the bread companies were not as prepared or they didn't have the capacity to cover everything that was happening. And Terranetti's, you know, we contacted them, we were able to work with them, Carnes worked with them, and they were able to make sure that we didn't have a gap in bread supplies for our customers. Um, so we were able to kind of take an existing relationship and reform it and make it work to, to fill those gaps, uh, to make sure folks had access to bread. Um, and that, that's just one of the ways, another way that we have to, to be creative. Um, folks ask me, can't you just order more? <laughs> and I, the answer is right now in our current climate, we as a retailer have restrictions from our wholesalers. You know, we're working with individuals and wholesalers are saying, whoa, hey, we need to make sure that we have enough for our other grocery stores. We need to make sure that we have the capacity to fill these orders. So we suddenly have restrictions on how much we can even ask for. Um, and for many days, the amount that we were ask, able to ask for was far less than the amount that we sold. So we knew for a period of time, we just kept on going into the negative. Um, we're seeing that change. Those restrictions are being lifted. It's easing as we fall into this new normal that we're in. Um, but that was a scary situation when you would walk into the store and you would kind of see those gaps and you think to yourself, what's going on? Um, but we are seeing that let up, uh, which is a really great, really great positive. Um, but we're seeing that let up at the same time, like I said, that flexibility of recognizing that you might not have your favorite flavor available because the focus for our consumer packaged goods companies really is those core items, getting down to who they are and number one, two, and three sellers. Um, that's really where they're putting their, their production value right now. Um, you know, that a lot of what I just talked about had to deal with the center of the store, you know, the aisles that you're in um, and those gaps. We've been fairly lucky as a retailer uh, thus far that we haven't really experienced those perimeter, the produce, the um, meats, the fruits, the vegetables. We haven't necessarily experienced a gap there. Um, for, for one, we still are a full service uh, meat department, meaning that we have 100 feet, 100 feet of cases of meat. And we have individuals behind the cases and they're able to get out your two pounds of chicken breast and hand it to you. Uh, for a lot of folks, that was a, a hindrance. A lot of retailers, that was a hindrance because it was coming in pre-packed. So there was an additional step there. There was additional supplies needed. Um, so it took a little bit of the pipeline to catch up. We're, we were very fortunate we didn't experience that. Um, we also were able to secure a lot of the fresh products, fresh produce from the restaurant industries. Um, those items, you know, to bring in the asparagus that was originally meant for restaurants. Um, we brought in salmon that was originally meant for Darden restaurants and, you know, it was earmarked and we were able to, to bring that in. Um, so we haven't seen those gaps in the perishables, um, but some assortments, some limitations, they are on the horizon. Um, again, it's not going to be a matter of there's not enough, um, but there are some facilities that are starting to experience worker absenteeism due to COVID-19. 
And subsequently, some of those fringe products within a line, maybe some marinated products, um, they are going to be cut from production temporarily. Um, you know, the, the disruption is going to happen. It, we're seeing it happen on our end. We know that the consumers will begin to see that happen as well. Um, so it, do, it does mean also a little bit of flexibility in the, in the perishable items when you're shopping. Um, but the, the products will be there. We just need to remember to be flexible. You know, as, as, as both Jen and Bob talked about, the three of us come from a, a food background, you know, an operational background. Um, and within the last month, we also had to suddenly take on the hats of putting health and sanitation and social distancing and supplies that I never knew I was ever going to purchase into the to-do list. You know, it's impossible to have this conversation about these gaps in the food industry without discussing the fact that we have to do so much more than provide food and necessities. You know, we're responsible for keeping our customers safe, responsible for keeping our team members safe during a very scary time. It's a very real time that, that that's scary. Um, and, and for, for me as a retailer, that's the, that's the hardest thing to come to terms with. Um, you know, things change by the day, as, as Bob said, you know, just when you think you have a game plan in place, an announcement is made. Um, and you do the best you can to regroup, restructure, figure it out, source whatever materials you need, but it's never as fast as you want. It's never as fast as anyone wants. Um, you have to provide that balance of getting everything in line while keeping a safe environment, while having the stock stores filled as much as possible. Um, and that, that's not settling down. You know, I, I don't see a slow on that. As far as store sanitation items, steps that we've taken, you know, our, our stores, Carnes, we've started closing two hours early. So we close at 8 p.m. Um, and our, our team has a special like backpack sprayer with, uh, that, they, that they use to spray the common touch areas, the carts go through the bathrooms, all the high, the high touch areas to really do a disinfectant. Um, you know, we have the social distancing decals down on the floor, space six feet apart throughout our stores um, and signs up. We have gloves provided. We have, we have approximately 1300 associates. Um, and so we are viciously sourcing masks right now because up until Friday, it was not a recommendation. That recommendation came out and now we are working as fast as possible to source those masks but we're working, fighting for those masks, just as every other retailer, just as other, you know, health industries, as other organizations, as private citizens are working to source those masks. And it is, it's an obstacle. Um, it, you, you do, you move as fast as you can, as quickly as you can, um, but there, there are very real obstacles in place. Um, we started doing temperature checks for our associates. Um, they clock in, we have the infrared scan thermometer. And just as another well-being check to make sure that, you know, they're, they are in line with the appropriate temperature so they're not exposing other associates, they're not exposing customers, um, and that they're aware of it as well. So we have that in, in place and we're soon as a, as a company going to be introducing one-way aisles um, just to allow a little bit more structure to try to promote social distancing. Some individuals are really great at keeping that distance. Um, other individuals, you know, it, it's a learning curve and any, any little reminder that can help is, is what, we're, what we're looking to do. Um, if you're, I have a four-year-old in the background, I apologize. <laughs> um, so if, if you're, if you were to ask me, what does the future look like? Uh, I wish I, I had that answer for you. Um, I wish I knew how long this was going to last or really how long it's going to take the grocery industry to recover and look like the grocery store that we knew two months ago. Um, I don't. 
Uh, but what I do know for the immediate is that you know, as retailers, we are continuously working to source products from as many locations as needed in order to supply the food and necessity to the shoppers when they come in the store to make sure that they have as much as possible that they're looking for. Um, I work in the stores still. Um, I, I have an office, but right now we're an on hand, all hands on deck industry. Um, so I'm in the stores about three, three days a week uh, out there. And as an in-store worker and, and just talking with our, my other team members, um, everyone's doing their best, but they're, they're scared. You know, this is a scary situation to be in. And I, I think it's important that people recognize that it's okay to be scared and that those folks who are checking you out and sucking the shelves, they feel that, you know, they're, they're aware of how serious this is. Um, a lot of times customers say to me, well, what can I do? Um, and, or what, what should I be doing to be prepared? Obviously, you know, your own self-protection, whether you have gloves, masks, you know, please put those in, in place if you're going to go into the store. Make a list, make a grocery list. Um, that way, if you're coming in once a week or maybe even every two, two weeks, every other week, if you can, um, put that into action, which is such a foreign idea as a retailer to tell people not to come in all the time. But right now, less is more. Uh, just for the society to get through where we're at. Um, be flexible with your shopping. Recognize that there's gonna be times where maybe something on your list just might not be available. And it's not because someone doesn't care. It's not because the store you're in doesn't care. It's often based off of what they can actually bring in. Um, and don't hoard. That yes, please no, no more hoarding. That just makes it more difficult on, on everyone else out there when you when you purchase more than, than you need. Um, but yeah, so that's where, as, as a retailer, where we're, what we're experiencing um, and what, what, what we're doing and kind of where we're moving into the future. So. Um, first, I would just like to say thank you to our panelists for sharing your thoughts and sharing the work that you've done in your organizations. Um, we'll now begin the question and answer session. And I would just like to remind everybody that if you have any questions for our panelists, please type them in the chat function and I will be directing your questions. So one of the questions that I've gotten from our audiences for uh, Proje Project Share specifically, the families that you were talking about, Rob, that are receiving foods from Project Share, do they communicate in another language other than English? Interesting question, because we just recently did a language uh, inventory here at Project Share. Uh, and the answer, the short answer is yes. Uh, what we found is uh, something that reinforced what we've been observing. We're seeing a growing population of Arabic speaking individuals uh, it happens to be the number one other language besides English that's spoken. Uh, number two is Spanish. Uh, so we're working on being able to provide translating translation services. Uh, we're, we, again, before everything turned a little sideways on us, we were working with uh, a group from uh, Dickinson College and from the community to uh, produce flyers and pamphlets and describing program in those two languages and working on establishing translation services. Uh, we're, we're regrouping on that effort right now. All right, thank you. Another question that I've gotten is, um, do we need to sanitize our groceries? for anybody on the panel? Uh, well, I by no means am a doctor, but I sanitize my, <laughs> my groceries. Uh, yeah, I, I think right now, um, there's actually some really great YouTube videos that show the best way to proceed and do that, um, where you have your, you bring everything in, uh, you have your, your clean side, where you put your sanitized groceries over. Um, 
in my mind right now, every little step that you can take, whether it, it gives you just the peace of mind, um, slash the health, you know, the, to, the sanitation to take place, I, I'd go for it. <laughs> Um, another question that I've gotten is how are your organizations sanitizing and keeping clean the food that you are able to provide for people at the moment? I guess this is both for uh, for everybody on the panel. Okay, so for for us um, at Carnes, you know, we do have a, a full additional layer of sanitation steps put into place with all within all of our stores. Um, you know, obviously that continues to grow literally by the week that that to do list that what you're supposed to be doing um you know by making sure we have individuals uh, touching them less a lot of times we are bringing pallets out onto the floor by bringing a whole pallet out versus putting it up on the shelf that is one less touch for each one of those products um so that is one you know less obvious step that takes place but there is something there to to a consideration there to keep in mind um you know, the additional disinfectants being used, wiping everything down, making sure individuals are utilizing gloves. Um, they are provided, we are requiring folks to use gloves while they're working. Um, so those are some of the steps that we've put into place. I can speak from the College Farms perspective. Uh, right now on our curbside pickup operation, uh, we're mostly distributing uh, root vegetables that have been in storage and we're opting not to wash them um, so that they're not being touched. They're actually taken from their storage bin with gloved hands and put in put directly into bags um, that are sealed for our customers to pick up. Any fresh greens that we're harvesting from our greenhouses, we actually have a three bay um, sink system um, where our greens are dunked three times. The third dunk is in a um, in a sanitizing solution and that's something that's approved through our organic certification um, and recommended through the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture. So not washing root vegetables right now and doing the sanitizing three, three bay sink um, wash has been our process. And I'd echo uh, a lot of what Andrea uh, said. With Project Share, we're, we're following basically the same steps. We've also taken steps to eliminate uh, in-kind food donations that come in in bulk. Uh, so one of our partners would, would send us bulk loaves of bread. So lots of bread in a great big bag that we had to take out and sort and repackage. And we've stopped doing that simply because it's, you know, we, we can't eliminate the risk of handling that. And so we just don't want to deal with it. Thank you. Another question that I've seen is, can Dickinson students do anything to help? And furthermore, can Carlisle, other Carlisle citizens do anything to help your organizations right now? So I can speak really quickly. I know um, Bob probably has a different um, perspective than I do. We've been getting an outpouring from the Dickinson campus community and the wider Carlisle community um, asking if we need helping hands at the farm, which has been very heartwarming um, to us. And um, I should mention that labor is an issue right now on all production farms, um, specifically in this area. A lot of our, our farming friends are having um, labor issues. Um, but we in particular are not encouraging volunteers. We're trying to minimize the um, exposure of people to the farm and the staff that are there full time. And so that has been our um, our policy. It breaks my heart to say that, but um, we're not really encouraging volunteers at this time. Yeah, I jump in and uh, from a Dickinson student and from a community standpoint, uh, the, the typical uh, response you might expect, volunteer, donate your time, talents, and treasures. But I think an underlying, an overarching message that touches all three of us on the panel is be patient. Uh, yeah, this it won't last forever. Yeah, you might not be able to get what you want to get at the grocery store, but you know what? Try a new recipe. Have fun. <laughs> I don't know about anybody else. I'm spending a lot more time in the kitchen with my family, and we're just making the best of it. Try something new.
Uh, thank you. The next question is uh, for any of your organization, is there a concern about having enough labor through the summer? Uh, so from the from a grocery perspective, you know, uh, the, the concern of labor is, is definitely real, you know, we, we see it taking place among um, some of the other partner organizations that we work with as uh, absenteeism takes place due to COVID-19, whether it's exposure, fear, or someone actually tests positive, you know, the, they are pulled out of that, that working environment. Um, the, the obstacles in place then are training, you know, you're supposed to keep six feet distance, you know, some social distance, and it's hard to train someone from that. Um, but we, we've been very fortunate thus far, uh, as far as being able to maintain our staffing levels and having a healthy, healthy staff on hand. Um, but the, that concern, that question mark is there. Now, from Project Share's perspective, uh, we're used to a seasonal fluctuation in volunteers, our equivalent of labor. Uh, as, as students get out of school, and into summer vacation mode, we see our student volunteer population decline uh, and we deal with that. It will be interesting to see uh, as some of our newer volunteers start going back to work or getting recalled in, in some ways, I think specifically school teachers. Uh, you know, we saw a shift in volunteers just recently as schools went back to online learning and teachers were called in for training and are now uh, engaging in online learning with, with students. You know, we see the same, we've had some great uh, folks from Dickinson volunteering and now Dickinson's ramping up their online learning activities. And one of, well, I had a professor in here today who teaches three days a week except today. And he just came over to get a break, but he's back teaching now. So just in a different way. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out over time. Yeah. Um, because of time constraint, uh, I'm just going to ask two more questions. And the next two questions are both directed towards specific organization, but if any of the other panelists, if you guys have anything to add, please do. Um, so the second to last question is for Project Share. Um, what are one or two biggest concerns for Project Share in meeting your needs for the next four to eight weeks? I kind of look at things as near term, mid term, and long term. Uh, near term, for example, will be farm stand distribution two days from now. Uh, the four to six week time frame will be kind of stabilizing and shoring up our supply chains and getting accustomed to uh, dealing with the new distribution model and being able to maintain, frankly, the quality of product that we're able to. Uh, distribute to our client base. Um, and our last question is for Jen. So some people are turning to community gardening and other forms of alternative agriculture, even at a very small scale. So would it be worth would it be worth publishing some guidelines for the community in the Dickinson website about this? That's a great question. Um, thank you for that. Uh, Yes and yes. Uh, and um, so as people probably on this um, call have seen, there's been a surge in home gardening um, over the past couple of weeks of, I mean, there's been articles written about it um, in the more of urban centers in terms of people thinking about uh, growing their own food. Um, ironically, I've been doing research for the past two years on addressing uh, food, insecurity, it, food insecurity through home gardening in Carlisle and um, have a student working with me this uh, semester and hopefully have two students work with me this summer, uh, specifically addressing barriers to home, garden, um, home gardening and helping people clear those barriers by developing strategies to help them grow their own food. Um, whether, and some of what we're thinking about because of COVID-19 is having online um, tutorials on how, how to do this, that, or the other um, based on barriers of information that we're collecting from residents in Carlisle on barriers to home gardening. Um, and I should mention there's a summer course that's going to be offered this uh, summer 
online, but it will be an introduction to sustainable garden, uh, sustainable agriculture with an um, underlying emphasis on food production. So um, there's that opportunity as well. So definitely keep an eye out for those types of things because um, that's part of the research that I'm involved with and the, the goal is to get out education um, to people who are interested in starting to grow their own food. And here's a plug uh, at Heverling Palmer Park, which is adjacent to our farm stand location. There are garden plots available. Uh, I know I got a message from Brenda Landis. They still have plots available if people are interested. Somebody help me. I think it's the Northside Neighbors Facebook page. It's the Heverling. I think that they have their own Facebook page. Um, okay. Thank you for saying that, Bob. And then there's just one more question before we end. Uh, someone asked where they can buy organic food. Great question. Uh, so Farmers on the Square is still going. Um, it moved outdoors uh, at the end of March when concerns of uh, social distancing was becoming more um, apparent. And so it is uh, the second and fourth Wednesday of um, April, so actually tomorrow, and then the fourth uh, Wednesday of April from three to six. Um, they are enforcing um, social distancing protocols, so stands are actually spaced six feet apart. Um, they have a curbside pickup um, process that uh, customers can order from specific vendors ahead of time, whether they're certified organic or not, um, and have the option for actually contact less um, curbside pickup where volunteers will actually put the groceries, pre-ordered groceries in their trunks. Um, starting in May, I think May 6th, uh, farmer's market goes every week. Um, and so that's from three to seven. There are also lots of um, CSA programs in the Carlisle area. So farms that are either certified um, organic or non-chemical or, all, you know, there's all kinds of labels you can add to farming practices, but there are a lot of amazing resources uh, in terms of farms in our region that are adapting to COVID-19 and structuring um, the ways that they can engage with consumers um, through, uh, you know, curbside um, pickups, uh, even delivery systems or um, home delivery options. So I think that if people have an interest in how to source local food, now's the time to really invest in your local um, ag, in my opinion. Uh, and there's lots of resources online. Um, and I just encourage you to go to the farmer's market and talk to the vendors or go to the farmer's market, Farmers on the Square website to learn more about the vendors and contact them via email um, to learn more about their, the, the protocols that they're establishing for their farming operations. Perfect, thank you for sharing. And that question concludes tonight's event. Um, thank you to all of our panelists for sharing such valuable information and thank you to our viewers for tuning in to tonight's event.